we have Mac McCusker, Sarah Torgerson, Teddy O'Say, and Maya Clough uh, joining us tonight. So thank you uh, all for being here and Kukuli, I'll let you take over. Well, you know, I'm a little nervous because uh, usually when I when I have these uh, Zoom talks, uh, I talk about my work and I know my work so well, so I don't even have to think. I go in uh, automatic, <laughs> but this time it's different. I have never um, uh, curated an exhibition, and when Regina came and and and, and talked to me about it. Uh, the idea of an exhibition in which we could talk about family or the meaning of family for for each of us as artists um, was quite intriguing and um, thinking about it um, it came to my mind the, the many generations that that are before my family um, that we don't even know their names and that uh, we wouldn't be here uh, if it were not for them and it's it's kind of um, sobering to think about all those many, many generations that came before us um, that the evidence of their existence is that we are here, but there's nothing else. And um, maybe uh, because of this time of my life, I am into acknowledgement and, and showing respect is that um, I think that our life is 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 a um, is an offering to the lives of the past, um, making sure that those lives go forward through us, even if we don't know who they are. So that 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 was the first uh, thought that I have about um, family portraits. Uh, the let me see if I can get. Uh, So uh, it is haunting to think about the people who were here in the world before us. Who were they? Who passed their DNA to us and with it gave us imprinted memories of their times and the times in which they, their own ancestors lived. There were a number of impossible to imagine acts of love and uh, also acts of violence for us to become. What is a family portrait, if not a snapshot, we choose to graph from a history of hundreds of years of survival, overcoming and living, living with all our might and against all odds. A family portrait may not include blood-related individuals or even those with whom we share physical likeness. It could mean perhaps the physical rendering of a trait which appears in the family tree as a legacy from our ancestors. It could be the sum of cultural elements of the place where we come from, or parents or grandparents came from. It could be an object that symbolizes the combination of cultural roots. It could be a self-portrait depicting the cultural elements that we recognize in ourselves and that belong to our heritage. Who are we but the sum of many lives, many experiences, many paths? Let's think of the offspring that will come in a hundred years from, from your family tree as her, his, their ancestor. What could you communicate about you and the ones that preceded you? This was just a departing point because everybody have their own idea of what family is and all ideas are equally important and exist. So, um, uh -oh. okay. okay. Um, so um, it was a pleasure to to be able to see a lot of artwork, and there were so many beautiful pieces. Uh, we were looking for elements that could make us think about uh, family in the broader possible way. And um, now we have four artists that are part of the exhibition and they are gonna have 10 minutes each to talk to us about their work. 
and how they got interested in in being part of this show and what is what they think about family and the first one would be maya maya are you there right yes i'm here <laughs> i just uh turn off the okay i can see now you guys <laughs> let's see you so um maya could you tell us a little bit about uh your work uh in general and in particular um the work that you have at the exhibition yeah so um i like a, like a coolie said my name is maya clef um and my uh general art practice really highly revolves around um the maternal experience uh, motherhood the psychology of motherhood, the interpersonal relationships within maternity. Um, and that really stemmed from my experience of becoming a mother um, very young and unexpectedly. I gave birth to my eldest daughter um, while I was in the middle of my BFA program. Uh, she very conveniently came during summer vacation. So I was able to give birth on break and then go back and finish my, my BFA two more years. Um, and so it was really just the perfect pressure cooker situation where I was already in an art school institution and was looking at my own personal um, experiences very critically through an artistic lens. Um, and I started looking around in my art history courses and in the on my own personal research and trying to see where art about motherhood existed um, and really kind of came up blank in just my first initial kind of um uh like grabs at it it was really hard to find where um motherhood was was represented um in the quote-unquote serious art world right um and so anyway so i was hooked from there and so uh continuing on to today i'm still just fascinated with motherhood and maternity um and these two pieces in the show um that uh are part of this part of the show um, first, you can see the one on the left of the screen is called um, My Mother Before Me, which is the series of, this, uh, of the seven pelvises. Um, and this work I really love, especially having just um, listened to Kakuli's statement on the show theme, um, because it really very directly talks to that generational line, thinking about who comes before us, who has come after us. So each pelvis is basically symbolizing um, the life of one woman to the next as as the generations go on through birth. Um, I really, really love the symbol of the pelvis and utilize it a lot in my work as um, far as it being kind of the support of the womb in pregnancy, um, but also uh, so it has that direct line and connection to pregnancy and um, reproduction, but I also really love um, thinking about it in uh, conjunction with the idea of like gut feelings, so trusting intuition, trusting um, bodily autonomy, um, and it just being kind of like a, a, a place of uh, uh, confidence and, and like I said, like intuition. Um, and also this piece, the, the pelvis piece came, uh, was inspired by a local author, a local Montanan author, um, named Molly Carol May, who, uh, who wrote the book um, Body Full of Stars. And she has, I wish I had pulled it up before, beforehand, but she has a phrase in this book that's about basically her personal experience of, of going through motherhood and, and kind of the turmoil that uh, transitioning from an individual into the role of motherhood and caretaking another person um, did to her personal life and kind of the uh, quote unquote normal crisis that she went through that all birthing people go through as far as finding, figuring out who you are uh, individually in conjunction with who you are um, as a caretaker. So anyway, uh, she had a line that says something very similar to um, what if the pelvises of uh, my mother and her grandmother were stacked one upon the other, creating a infinite spine, you know, and so the spine also uh, denoting kind of the strength and um, connection. Um, that I also then utilize in just the singular pelvis and other works that I have. Um, so, and then the piece on the right is called The Myth of Complete Balance. Um, and this work I really 
made as a critique of um, kind of the larger social view of what motherhood is being um, the very, you know, the very stereotypical thoughts around mothers are automatically nurturing and um, can do it all and um, the kind of the pedestal, pedestalizing of the role of motherhood um, and just making it kind of as absurd and as uh, uh, otherworldly as I could basically this, you know, the literal idol of the baby and this very uncomfortable and obviously not um, natural way of the, of the female figure holding this child up um, and that she becomes the pedestal to this kind of idolized child. Um, and uh, anyway, so like I said, it's kind of a critique of um, the impossibility of being able to quote unquote balance it all or do it all, um, but how um, birthing people come into this role and very, very quickly feel the pressure to be able to step into this kind of, uh, again, idolized position. That, you know, it, it's very interesting. Um what you what, everything that you have said um, from the from the fact that sometimes you don't find motherhood in the arts and and I'm so glad that you are you are doing it uh, so so uh, not confrontational but you know with assertiveness because it is true I I have uh, had uh, young students young art students and young artists telling me, that as as women they they feel un, they feel still uncomfortable of dealing with maternity in their artwork because it's not considered serious, mm -hmm. and uh, unfortunately I think that that is uh, is changing, and um, I had my daughter at forty eight, uh, and I uh, you know I like I I I see the the the, the work on the right uh, the the woman holding the baby and. And mothers, and make me think about how mothers we are expected to be perfect, and uh, and the hardest part is uh, that the children expect in a way to to have a perfect mother and an imperfect father. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a and 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 it's something that I you know that I also. Uh, was more critical about my mother than about my father. And, and I wonder, you know, um, how can we stop that? Because mothers, we are, we are just human beings. Mm -hmm. It's so true. I, uh, just a quick note, I gave an artist lecture uh, back at the beginning of the year. Um, and uh, there's not, a, it's a piece that isn't included in, in today's slides, but there's a piece that I have that's like this woman's a oversized bust and she's crying and it's, um, um, kind of my first stab at talking about like uh, postpartum depression and anxiety and the, the psychological um, phenomenons that can happen with maternity. And um, like you were saying that children often view their mothers as perfect and their fathers being able to be unperfect. And there was this young man, um, a college student that was in the audience that uh, participated in the Q&A after and he said something about um, you know, even at that age, he was probably, you know, early 20s, and uh, I had talked about this piece and the statistics around maternal um, depression and anxiety, and he said in the Q&A after, he's like, I had, I had truly never thought about my mother in this realm and how this experience of her being a mother could have affected how the way, the way that she treated me in, you know, in various good ways and bad ways, um, and so we, he and I talked a little bit about um, the very fine balance of you wanting your children to feel safe and protected. Um, and like, in, in then you want, you want in a way for your parents to be infallible, right? Because you want your children to have kind of a solid foundation, but then mm -hmm. like you were saying, clearly, where's the line as far as when those children become adults, that they have the ability to see their parents, specifically mothers, um, as like a human being that, Humans, yes. Yeah. How about these two these two pieces that we're looking at right now? 
Yeah, so these are um, two other works that I um, created a couple years ago. Um, so the one on the right is called Crown. Um, and that's an example of what I was speaking of earlier as far as how I really like using utilizing the pelvis um, singularly in other ways. Um, it's just a, it's a symbol that I keep coming back to. And this was, um, I think the first time that I had, actually I take that back. I had made a piece similar to Crown um, that wasn't as successful and this was my second take at it. But this uh, very specific idea of kind of wearing the, the pelvis as a crown um, was my first time using the symbol of the pelvis um, as a, kind of a marker of, like I said, of strength and, and um, centrality in the body and, um, and uh, the keeper, like I, I like saying like the keeper of gut feelings as well as um, uh, that cradle for reproduction. And I, when I made that piece, the crown, um, I also really wanted it to, I very specifically didn't uh, wanted to, want to talk about motherhood in this way using like reproductive organs um, I want it because I wanted it to be more about womanhood in general. Um, and so it's void of the uterus and, and ovaries and fallopian tubes. Um, because even if a, if a woman does not become a mother, it does not make her any less of a woman where again, in society, in these idealized, um, takes and views of motherhood, it often feels like, um, if a woman does not become a mother, she does not reach her full potential, right? But her being an individual is enough. Um, so that was kind of just the rough uh, ideas around that piece. And then um, <clears throat> the piece on the left um, is another piece uh, similar to my mother before me, the pelvis stack piece that speaks to um, kind of genera generational lineage. Um, so it's called uh, What is Passed Down or Heirloom. Um, and it was the first piece that I started talking about um, or start, started thinking about um, uh, maternal rage. So I wanted to kind of uh, flip this uh, iconography of like the soft teddy bear, the comforting teddy bear, and make it a more realistic bear that's angry and um, kind of visceral and uh, have this child that's kind of a blank canvas um, holding on to something that symbolizes motherhood being the bear um, like a mother bear that can be both protective but also vicious and um, kind of self-destructive um, and uh, so like I said it's kind of the first time that I started to play with that um, theme of mother bear and I'm really I have a few more pieces that I hope will hope will make in the next couple of years of um, continuing on with that with that mother bear theme. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Maya. Yeah, thank you, Kukui. And this is the, I'm sorry, the, I, this is a piece, this is the last piece is a... Yeah, this is the, this is that last piece that I sent. Um, and uh, this one is called, um, Where Do I End and You Begin? So this one is very directly about the interpersonal relationship between mother and infant or mother and toddler. Um, and it was, uh, my attempt to kind of illustrate the monotony of um, early motherhood. And so it, uh, especially specifically if uh, a mother chooses to breastfeed. So these are all um, four by four tiles that were taken from source images of just me and my son, who's now three years old. Um, so some of the tiles are just me, some of the tiles are just him, some of the tiles are me and him in different, you know, connecting points of touching. Um, and the idea is that they are just, uh, they span probably about a year, but all together they just blend together and there's no, um, set format to how they are displayed. So even though they are marking a period of time, there's not, they're not directly chronological, um, on the wall. It's a very powerful installation. Thank you. Thank you so Mark. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, okay, so this is the piece that's in the exhibition, and uh, uh, Regina actually asked me to be in it and uh, to kind of depict my idea of what a, a family portrait would be. And uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm transgender, and in kind of the, I don't know, the, the 
what's going on in the world today as far as the, the politics around, surrounding the transgender community and trans kids and uh, trans people in sports. Um, I just wanted to depict somewhat my experiences, but also uh, it seems like the experiences of what other trans people are going through and that um, many of us don't have family support and we certainly don't have a lot of uh, the support from the, the larger community or, or the, you know, at least the United States uh, in just our lives and what's going on. We don't frequently have health care. We have, uh, um, we are frequently denied access to housing. Uh, we have a lot of uh, mental health issues because of the things that are surrounding what's going on. And um, me personally, I, when I came out as trans, I didn't, I didn't lose my family, but they, um, they still communicated with me, but they were not nice and uh, not accepting and uh it took it took a while they've, they've sort of come around somewhat now but it, it's taken quite a, some time for them to get used to it but also the fact that i didn't have a role model there were no there were no people i knew in the public eye especially not a trans artist that i could look up to to see how they paved the way before me so i didn't have anyone to really um uh, ask questions or to, to give me any advice or or um, teach me anything about how to kind of walk the path that I'm walking. So I try to now be that for other people. And I have a lot of kids message me now on Instagram and Facebook and stuff like that, that, um, you know, at least see some possibility of moving forward with talking about their lives and their art as trans individuals. That's kind of why I do what I do. So they, they have become like a family to you. Because they have, they have. For them. You are the one who is helping them you know, in the way that you would have wanted to to be guided or to be supported when, when you were a kid. Yeah, I actually make this mug that that says, uh, be who you needed when you were younger. And mm -hmm. um, I, I kind of try to think that of myself whenever I get stuck. And, and, it, and it helps me when I am having a harder time to know that, uh, you know, somebody will reach out to me and that I, that I can help someone. It actually helps me to, to uh, feel better about what it is that I'm doing, even when I do get uh, a fair amount of abuse online for what I do. Oh, I'm so. sorry to hear that. But I think that you are accomplishing a very important mission in that sense. And, and those kids are, are receiving the family support that maybe they are not getting at home to, through you. I hope so, yeah. Yeah. Let's see. How about this piece? Um, so this piece is, is kind of about, uh, sort of about the abuse that I get. Um, it is uh, me and the, if you can't see the, the, the image on the t-shirt is the transgender symbol and the t-shirt, the whole t-shirt is shredded and it's me trying to sew it back together. And so it's sort of about, um, I guess, self-repair and uh, trying to, to uh, constantly heal over wounds that that are caused by family by society by um abuse that i get online abuse that i get from the art world in general um i get a, i got a fair amount of uh harsh criticism from the ceramics community when i started doing this kind of work oh really um, why what did they say um they they a few people said well i should just put on a dress and then i would get the attention you're getting uh i mean it was just yeah, <laughs> or the or the only reason I was up there talking was because I was trans. It had nothing to do with the fact that I was a good artist. I mean, it was just it was amazing. <laughs> and these are some of these are prominent figures in the ceramics community, which I won't mention names, but uh, um, who have since apologized. But <laughs> uh, yeah, wow. so I mean, so, so this piece of the you know, it's um, it's about me being vulnerable as well. So it's why it's me in my underwear, you know. Um, and I feel like that's a uh, that's a question that trans people get a lot about our bodies, about what we've done to our bodies, about what we're going to do to our bodies, about you know how they work, and you know just just a lot of invasive questions that you would never ask anyone else. Um, very inappropriate questions, and uh, and we're just expected to to answer them, you know. And it's just it's it's a, it's very difficult to have these conversations with other people because I want to be the person to provide education and to provide the tools that that people need to talk about these issues and to talk about pronouns and to, pronouns and to talk about um, just the conversations that we should be having versus the conversations people want to have. Uh, but having those, providing that education can be take, take a toll, you know, it, uh, because I do get asked these questions that really have nothing to do with what I'm trying to educate people about. Um, so, you know. But you know, it, I'm, 
I'm sorry. No, I, go ahead. I, I like the I like the vulnerability that that the the character or or it's a self portrait, right? Mm -hmm. That you have uh, in the piece, and I think that the important part about art is that is a is a communication between the artist and society, and the most honest we are through that communication. Um, that the most effective it is, the most powerful it is. And uh, amazingly enough, uh, artwork can be the most powerful when we are the most vulnerable in it. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Um, it, it was it actually was not my choice to to make work about being trans. Um, I started doing it because of the bathroom bills that happened in North Carolina. And for those of you who don't know, Charlotte passed an ordinance to, that uh, protect, protected trans people of using the bathroom of their um, gender identity and uh, North Carolina state came back and, and rescinded that right and uh, made it, I guess, uh, sort of against the law to use the um, the bathroom of your gender identity. You, you had to use the bathroom that aligned with the sex that was on your birth certificate. And so I was just so mad, I was so angry about it that I made this one piece about um, using the bathroom and uh, it got a lot of attention and it, and it sort of catapulted me into the spotlight about that particular issue. And I then sort of felt obligated to continue to do that work because it did get attention and because it did start people having conversations about it and good conversations about it. Um, but that particular bill, the bathroom bill, um, just put my life and other people's lives in, in the, the public dialogue and you know just made our very private lives in a, into a public dialogue and uh, put many of our lives in danger. I mean, I, at the time, had just started transitioning and I looked very androgynous and I got yelled at in restrooms constantly. People you know, then started to look for people who didn't look male or female or for people who they, they didn't think looked male enough or female enough, whatever that means. And a lot of masculine women who were not trans got assaulted. A lot of feminine men who were not trans got assaulted. You know, And so it just caused a lot of problems unintended problems, but maybe intended problems because we're supposed to act a certain way. If you are presenting as masculine, you're supposed to act a certain way. If you're feminine, you're supposed to act a certain way. And and, and the, the categories and the stereotypes are ridiculous. None of us fit those, you know? No, no, I completely, I completely agree. Um, we are so rigid in terms of who is who and what is what. And we forget that the most important part is that human beings have the right to choose how they they feel happy and you cannot force them to be happy in one way or another right and i think that doing the work that you do is is necessary it's important it's painful to make it i'm sure uh, because what it means but i i kind of uh, understand when when you have when you feel like you have to say something about it no matter what and that's what art is about it's a way yeah. of, of speaking and speaking with the strength. The part yeah, I don't... from your vulnerability, which I, I love that that contradiction. You know, you're the strongest, the most vulnerable you are. It's, it's just yeah. my brain. I gave a, um, a lecture at Enseca in 2017 about that piece and about some other work that I did about these issues. And um, it was in Portland, Oregon. And last year, a uh, a person messaged me on Instagram. They posted on their Inst Instagram account and they tagged me in it. And it said that um, they had just transitioned. They just started their transition and they never would have had the courage to do so had they not heard me talking in Sika in 2017. Oh. And I just, I, I, I totally cried over that. I just, yeah. you know, that just made me feel like um, that, that it was all worth it. You know, the, the good and the bad and everything that I've, I've done. And even if it was just that one person that had, um, you know, positive experience from them. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's it's amazing that you've been able to change lives for the better, helping them to be themselves. Yeah. How about this piece? Uh, this was kind of like right in the middle of my transition. And uh, I was living in Bakersville, North Carolina, which is a teeny, teeny, tiny town right outside of Penland, um, North Carolina. And uh, it was I had really just started taking testosterone. So I, I, I looked masculine somewhat, but I still looked very feminine. And uh, I got, this is, this is about the time when I was getting uh, asked a lot 
you know, are you a boy or a girl? Um, and so I kind of made a joke about it. So it says transition pending and uh, the little, <laughs> the little circular thing is your computer that's, that's still, you know, processing. Um, and on the back of this, it's, it actually says, um, boy, some assembly required. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I don't know. I just I, I choose to to do humor a lot around this subject matter because it is a serious subject, and to make it uh, funny sometimes makes it a little more palatable of, a, of content for people to talk about. So I make fun of myself a fair amount. Humor is always good. Yeah, I just laughing at yourself is usually pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so yeah. much, Mike. You're welcome. And this is, I'm sorry, I'm... That's okay. Uh, so this, this was a piece about um, after the Pulse shooting in Orlando, um, uh, Omar Mateen killed, I think it was 49 individuals. So this is 50 bottles of beer on the wall and it's got the Pulse logo on it. And on the back of those is the picture of the person who was um, murdered and uh, it, this, this was an installation in Asheville. It actually traveled a bit um, in, at other exhibitions, but it was for me about the gay bar and about um, the place where many of us found our families who did not, were not accepted by our families. And so we went to the gay bar and we found our community. We found people who accepted us. We found people who we could talk to, people who were, became our mentors, people who could help us understand or who could understand what we were going through at the time. And so that attack on Pulse for me was an attack on that that idea of family that so many of us had, and it was attack on that um, that safety net that I guess that we thought we had that we no longer felt that we had you know because of these things that happened because of the the violence against the gay community and the LGBT community and um, the trans community it's it's a it's a real thing and that kind of brought it all to the foreground the the danger that that is inherent just for being who you are. Yeah. You know, many times uh, people ask me, why don't you do something else besides talking about colonization? And I bet that many times people have told you, why don't you do something else that is besides, you know, issues of, of, of transgender or, or or gay life? And um, it's not, it's, what I say is that it's not possible to talk about something else when it's something that is so pressing. And I imagine right. you feel the same thing. It's not a matter. It's not a matter that we see it and say, "Oh, I'm going to talk about this now." It's because it's something that is in in your heart that comes through your hands and has to be materialized, isn't it? It is. I mean, I would love to sit around and make happy, happy, happy sculptures all the time, but uh, you know, but that's not what's going on in my life, and that's not what I live with every day, and that's not what's going on. So I, I, I feel like someone has to say it. And uh, fortunately, there, there are a lot more non-binary and uh, trans artists that are out there, ceramic artists that are coming up. And uh, I actually curated, curated an exhibition two years ago um, for Northern Clay Center uh, that had um, five trans and non-binary non artists. So people are coming up behind me and I can't wait because I, I'm kind of tired of being the token trans person to talk. <laughs> but uh, it's a uh, I'm always I'm always happy to, to provide education to people. It's just you know maybe not happy to, but I'm always going to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, one should do what comes from your heart, you know. Right. And that's right. it. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, Teddy. Hello, Willie. Where are you? Okay, I can see you now. So, what can you tell us about about the work in the exhibition? Thank you so much. I think um, I'm really enjoying the presentation of the other artists, just looking at very um, realistic sculptural representation of their works. So with, with my forms, I push my forms to a place where they look very abstract, but also have a relationship with the human form in a way to where you begin to read them as a figure, where you see the head, the body, and probably a leg. So most of my, most of my forms kind of like revolve around that idea. and. The overarching theme of my work is such that I, I'm very much interested in using my work to explore my identity um, as a Ghanaian living in, in a different sociocultural space, that is the United States of America. And with this um, piece of work, it's form, it forms part of a large body of work that I worked on known as um, Body Series. 
And with this, I was interested in um, investigating how the human form is used as a symbol of identity, as a symbol of belonging, as a symbol that connects us to like a larger part of a society in the context of even family. So I come from a place where you can see simple, so language becomes, um, sorry, pattern becomes more like a language. So you can see something as simple as maybe, probably maybe a mark on someone's face, and it helps you connect the person to a specific family, a specific tribe, a specific um, community within where um, I grew up, that is Ghana. So just kind of like exploring with these ideas in this form to mm -hmm. where um, I started bringing the idea of like symbolisms of color. So you could see most of my pieces, you see black and gold, where the black represents the idea of like my identity as probably a black person. And also the gold speaks of like wealth, royalty, and just also dovetailing into the fact that I come from a place where we have royalty within our lineage. So just kind of like playing with that identity on this form. And also this piece has specific um, features or elements on it that kind of like, it's more like I'm, I'm in this socio-cultural space, but there is a void on my inside. So you, you could see a hole at the back of the piece that talks about the void that I fell on the inside where you look to your left, you look to your right, like there are a lot of unfamiliar faces and unfamiliar people all around you, either under like the family and the people that you grew up with. So it was at a point in time in my life where, and this piece was made during the COVID period where I really wanted to go home and spend some good time with my family because it's been a while I saw them. But at the same time, borders have been closed and the idea of like being in this space, feeling trapped in a space. So you, you realize that the title of this piece is called Envelope to where I, I felt like I was trapped within this space and the idea of access was very difficult in a way. So I created this space within the form that speaks of a safe place, but at the same time, it speaks of a void that is found on my inside where I kind of like go within that void, try to see if I could find familiar um, faces or familiar people to be able to connect with in a way. So that was one of um, the inspiration that was behind um, the creation of this form. And as I said, the color symbolism plays into the idea of like my identity as a Ghanaian and where I come from um, as a Ghanaian, having a, a, a royal lineage. That's interesting because it's, uh, in, in aesthetic terms, every every nation, every culture have, have very specific elements that speak of them historically. And uh, and you are rep in this rep in this representation. Well, in in this piece, there's the representation of yourself, and at the same time, the representation of your culture and the absence of family or the absence of cultural elements that identify you in yeah. your surroundings. Yeah. How how big is this piece? So it should be about um, be about eighteen inches tall, I think so. I don't have the exact measurements in my head, but mm -hmm. it's it's not really a life size, but. Are you are you alone here? And when I say alone, it's without people that are part of your family here in, in the so United States. I'm, I'm, I'm actually the first person to probably do a master's in my family. So more like for like first generation college. So I'm the only one here. Oh. Yeah. Oh. The only one here in the United States. Yeah, I know that feeling. <laughs> I'm by myself. I well, I, I have a family now up to 30, 30 years, but I came by myself. How about these forms? So these forms I, I was thinking in a place where I was looking at the past, the present, and the future. So it's actually three forms that goes in line and how the past has a direct or indirect influence on what is happening now and how the future can be predicted within the context of what is happening now. So just kind of like playing with these ideas and creating these linear forms within the uh, piece. So in this piece, I was also thinking of how people tend to use this form as more like um, a window through which they are, they are able to see what is happening 
within my life at that point in time. So I created, so this, um, the holes that were created in the forms have specific dimensions. They are not all of equal dimensions to where one, one was very big, whereas as it, as it progresses, it kind of like shrinks and which talks about um, a number of things but I don't want to go into the nitty bits of, of that. So I use specific elements to represent like specific things that was happening in my life within that time frame, and just talking about the past, the present, and the future. These three forms um, plays within that context. Well, I thought that the next form here, yes. Okay, yeah, so, yeah. So this form. I'm I'm curious. Um, when when I went when I did my BFA, I I had a um, it was hard for me to go through college because I felt like art history was not uh, taking my heritage into account, and also art theory wasn't actually talking about people like me. And um, do you have the or, or I should ask, how is your experience? So. Um... I mean, I don't use the word misrepresentation or probably considering the canons of arts. I think as far as my experience go, I feel like I'm still growing in that field. And I'll just speak for myself and not probably for the larger audience, because I think the canons are gradually being changed to where there's a lot of like representation in terms of like um, the minority in a way. So I, I wouldn't want to speak to that effect, but I'll speak to probably my own self. I think. Um, Making that comparison between um, back home in Ghana and here in the United States, I think that's there's been a lot of opportunities for me as far as like trying to showcase my work and what I do as an artist, as compared to probably maybe being in Ghana. So I, I, I would I would say there's definitely um, a lot of um, growth in that area that I, I can personally see happening. Okay, good. Let me see if I have another piece of yours. I think that's it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Sarah. Hello. How are you doing? Good, how are you? <laughs> um, so my work generally, um, I, I work a lot with margins, um, both physical and, and kind of relational margins. Um, it's a good jumping off point for me to think about relationship of self and other, self and ecosystem. Um, and then like fin finite and ephemeral um, aspects of both materiality and, and um, life ways. Um, so the piece on the left, the, the fabric placenta in a ceramic bowl, um, really kind of grew, well, I, I have this just like pile of weird pieces of stuff that I just move through different areas of work. Um, I'll complete one piece and then take it all apart and then make it into something else. And so that actually is the origin of this, this placenta was for something completely different. Um, and my relationship with my biological family is a, a little complicated. They're all very far away in California. And I came out to Ohio, I don't know, 12 years ago um, and have since have a nine-year-old daughter where I, I have raised her pretty much by myself. Um, but my mom's a medical transcriptionist and we got talking about placentas and they're a really bizarre marginal organ that we all have had one. We, we were all born with that, this margin between our bodies and another body um, that is our closest sustained proximity to another human. Um, and we need them. It's it that is actually what makes life possible um, for us as human beings. And then, as soon as we're born, we never want to think about that thing again. It is this repulsive, like cast off. <laughs> um, and I think that that stems from multiple like avenues, right? Like we don't actually want to feel that close or that indebted to our past, and we don't also want to think of ourselves as meat. Or, or organ bound beings really, we're kind of like, you know, gazing at the stars all the time. Um, so that's what that piece is about um, and kind of the things that I was thinking up about as I was making it. Um, and it allowed me just to kind of play with surface and I, I'm just endlessly uh, 
kind of interested in how materials work. So clay was like this, this thing that I found in, in undergrad, well, before undergrad, but really, really found in undergrad, um, that I just love the way it moves and I love the way it comes out of my hands and in these kind of like impulsive, compulsive forms. Um, and then the second uh, work on the right is, is actually a, a portrait of my daughter um, that I made shortly after I uh, graduated from with my master's degree, which was kind of a huge endeavor for both of us. And I'm in con like constantly in her debt for putting up with our life during that time. Um, and so I, I was kind of thinking about how much both of us had grown through this very, very strange experience that coincided with COVID and would have really been hard on our relationship had COVID not happened and kind of looking at life through the lens of being given gifts and hardships as as a kind of a an equal measure. Um, so my maternal grandmother um, taught me to sew and knit and do a lot of the things that I, I love doing. Um, and I found that, you know, as much as ceramics is, is often um, seen in the art world as a marginal material, and I think that's changing over time, but I had to I had to fight hard for ceramics in my MFA. And, uh, and then as I was fighting and, and got, getting more and more exhausted by it, I was like, well, I'll just give them fiber art. Then they really, then they'll like really have something to get worked up about. I'll just go full domestic. Um, and I really associated these two things very closely. Like I had to put clay and paint down when my daughter was born in a large way because I just couldn't hold her and be that dirty. Um, so I made her her stuffed animals and baby clothes and all kinds of stuff and really taught myself how to sew in a, a new and kind of uh, sculptural way. Um, so anyway, long story short, this, this piece, um, all of the fabric components are these little yo-yos that are just little discs of fabric uh, sewn together and I have um, my maternal grandmother has passed away a few years ago now but I had a blanket or the like beginnings of a blanket that she had made that I kind of took a few little of these these yo-yos out of um, my mother helped me make a lot of them and sent them from San Diego um, and I taught my daughter how to make them and then there there are actually some from my great-grandmother as well, and most of it is actually clothing from our respective childhoods, kind of like bound up into this figure of my daughter um, sewing herself together. Because I think we all kind of take pieces of our histories and then we send them into our futures, whether that's in physical, biological children or in the forms that we make um, in clay uh, or anything else. Um, so I think we're always just kind of reaching the we're a bridge between our past and our future always. Um, so that's these two pieces. Um, how about these ones? <laughs> um, so I, I love knitting um, and I love clay. And so I really, it shows. <laughs> what's that? It shows. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm lightly obsessed with spiders because I, I just did a ton of research on them over the last few years. And um, the, the way that they uh, signify their, their homes in space is, is both a risk and a reward that putting up a web uh, lets everyone in the neighborhood know that they're there, but it also makes it possible for them, them to eat. So I thought a lot about that in the way that we present in the world and how risky that can be. Um, and is just uh, the further down you go with that process, um, or the more honest or vulnerable you are in that process, I think it, it gets riskier, but also the rewards are greater. Um, so I, I was thinking about that and making this kind of spiraled in, um, almost collapsing, but maybe just super extended human form. Um, I like playing with fiber and clay specifically because it, creates this kind of ongoingness in a finite form um, that I find is not, it's just really hard for me to, to think that many things through one material. So um, this is wood-fired uh, 
because I, I love that process is just like wonderful and magical. And then um, I've been experimenting with dyeing all of my most recent pieces with actual clay, uh, the, the fiber components are dyed with clay as well. So trying to figure out the way that these materials can really start to morph and do new and interesting things together. Um, and then the piece on the right, um, I actually made an undergrad and that was, a, or in, not an undergrad, in graduate school. And that was the breakthrough piece of like, I built this ceramic figure halfway up. Everybody was giving me just like a terrible time about like why I was even doing this with my life. And I was like, well, fine, <laughs> I won't even finish it. And I'll just knit a top. And that is was a pretty good punctuation on my first uh, semester of graduate school where I was just um, trying to figure out how to fit into a world that was just demanding all kinds of strange new conceptual things for me just to kind of grind me down, it seemed like at the time which you know was good. I learned a lot, learned how to talk about things it was necessary, but I was just like, so I just wanted everybody to leave me alone. Um, but again, it was this wonderful way to bring in um, things that I had not ever thought of using in, in an artistic practice in a public way um, and combining them together. And what did they say when you did made that this piece? Um, what was the critique the the people that did not like my craft quote unquote craft based work to begin with were even more appalled and the people that kind of liked it to begin with were like super excited so it was a really good way for me to find my people in that scenario um but you know you can't take everybody with you you can try yeah no definitely it's interesting the pressure that is given to students when they are in graduate programs. I I didn't uh, I didn't get a master's degree. I never thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't either until I, I decided to go back, and I'm glad I did. But if I'd known what I was signing up for, I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a it's a, a world of its own, and sometimes uh, I have dedicated myself when I go to give uh, talks to to ask the students. Uh, do you remember what was at the core of your practice at the beginning you know mm -hmm. because sometimes i feel like it's lost there's so much pressure and so many mm -hmm. um things that they have to think into uh, uh, it, take into account uh, our theory referencing something else and that uh, i feel like at the end uh sometimes people can get lost <laughs> yeah it's it, why it's, they do it you know why why are you an artist to begin with right and what does that actually mean you know like what does it mean to to perform artist in a in a academic setting versus to be an artist where you're you're the sole translator of what it is you have to say so i think it's it's interesting in that you can hone how to say what you need to say or how to support what you need to say but it's not going to teach you how to be who you are yeah, it, it and and I think that's a very important thing to keep in mind. Um, yeah. How about so, this? And and then we are, we are out. Wow, we have done. Yeah, we're probably over. This this piece is also about relationship. It's clearly not a good one. Um, this is this is informed by my <laughs> biological family somewhat. Just uh, the the title savior complex, and I think that it's kind of stands on its own unless you have questions. <laughs> Yeah, family is an important part of our life, but we shouldn't romanticize them it either. Yeah, it's complicated. Right, let me stop share. Okay. Wow, that has been an incredible uh, trip to everybody's work. And thank you so much. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you for sharing uh, your thoughts and your work.